Go to John the first chapter. John the first chapter verses 1 through 14. John the first chapter verses 1 through 14. I know I got a lot. I hope your shoes don't expire before we finish reading this. I usually only read like three or four verses, but I don't know. We might have to do all of them. It depends on what the Holy Ghost says. God, we stop in this moment to acknowledge your presence in this place. You are a powerful God and your presence is undeniable. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us the grace and the privilege of being here. Thank you. We do not count it a chore nor a task, but we were glad when they said unto us, let us go into the house of the Lord. For we know in your house is your presence. Your presence dwells here, lives here, and in your presence there's fullness of joy. There is liberty. And so for that, God, we're so grateful. Thank you. It is good that we have been here with you on today. And we praise you and honor you and ask that even in this moment that you kill our ignorance with your truth. That you let us see ourselves through the lens of your word. That it washes us, cleanses us, transforms us from the inside out. That it changes everything about us so that we can be better and we become who you desire for us to be. Cancel every demonic distraction in the name of Jesus Christ. Every dart, every vice, every text message, every social media post. Cancel the distractions in the name of Jesus Christ. Every bad relationship, every bad encounter, every frustrating thing that happened on our way to the house of God. Cancel every distraction in the name of Jesus Christ. The foolish, frivolous voices that we've been hearing all week, all month, and even all year last year. Cancel every distraction so that we might maintain that Jesus, you are the reason and you are all that we need. Thank you for being our complete sentence. Thank you for being both our beginning and our ending. And as we explore throughout the course of this year who our Savior is, help us to know more of you so that we might serve you better and you might be pleased with our lives. In the name that is above every other name, in the name that can, that shall, and that will, in the name of Jesus, let every heart shout amen. amen. In verse, verse 1, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the... Come on, say it with me. In the beginning was the... And the... Was God. And the... Was with God. I said it wrong. Let me do it again. In the beginning was the... And the Word... I'm sorry. And the... Was with God. And the... Was God. The same in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was light, or the light of men. Let's go to verse 5. And the light shrinketh in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Please be clear, this is not, this is John the Baptist. This is not John, the writer of this book. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Pay attention to verse 10 and 11 right quick. He was in the world. Who are we talking about? Say it again. Jesus. Come on for your neighbor. Jesus. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. I talked about it on New Year's Eve celebration. How many of us can testify that we've seen a transformation of church? Okay, let me do it a different way. That we've seen a transformation of believers. And not for the good, but for the distracted. We've seen where distractions have now become the prevailing theme of even believers. Okay, let me say it a different way. Where believers don't act like believers. Where people of God don't act like they're the people of God. Where people are more consumed with assimilating into culture than they are being different from the culture. Have you seen it? So this is what it's talking about here. He says he was in the world and the world was made by him. 
and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him. Now go to verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God, make it make sense. Preach through me and to me in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our incredible God. Our theme for the year is? Jesus. Come on, say it loud and proud. Our theme for the year is? Jesus. Jesus, 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 just Jesus, period. To God be the glory for giving us power and access to the proxy of his name. He is an incredible God to allow us to even have access to be able to use the authority of his name to create dynamic shifts in the earth. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Stuff has to leave you alone at the name of Jesus. Cancer is healed at the name of Jesus. Peace is restored at the name of Jesus. Wars will be ended when people receive the name of Jesus. Chaos and confusion becomes calm at the name of Jesus. We receive power in the name of Jesus. The best prayer you can pray when you're in trouble is what? <laughs> when you're in trouble, sometimes you don't have to, you don't have time and you don't have patience to be able to say, oh, Father God. No, sometimes when it's real hot, I just got to holler, Jesus. In this book, in this year, rather, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through every dynamic, dynamic theme, every dynamic principle and practice of Jesus's life. We need to learn about him. I, I am amazed, and can I just be real about it? I'm actually offended and appalled. And, and, and I'll even go ahead and, and, and give you this transparency here, this transparent moment. I'm actually even convicted that there are so many people who have been following me for the last 18 years, so many people who are encountering the kingdom's cause, even around, around the world. There's so many people who are sitting in the seats of sanctuaries all, all over the country, all over the world right now in the name of Jesus that don't even know him. Can, can we be real about it? You know of him, but you really don't know him. You can't tell me the intricate details of his life. He gave you the chronicles of his own life. He even exhibited and exemplified his own heart. He put his heart on his sleeve and wore it outward so that you could even see what was going on on the inside. It's not often that you get to take a peek into every detail, every facet of a person's existence. But Jesus is so incredible that he says, no, I need you to learn of me. I need you to be able to walk with me. I need you to know me intimately. So I'm going to make sure that I instill the power of my spirit and my grace upon the people who are going to chronicle every detail, every facet of my entire existence so that there will be no reason for the enemy, Satan, Beelzebub, uh, for, for Lucifer, for the one who was evicted from heaven. There'll be no reason and no way for him to lure you away and cause you to miss heaven when I'm going to make sure that you have a guaranteed spot and not spend it in hell. Somebody thank God for that. Just, I, know, I know that's not heavy to you yet, but I promise when you know what he's, he's done for you, it will cause you to celebrate on another level. Jesus is, is real. It's not just a song from the 80s. Jesus is real. I know the Lord is real to me. No, Jesus is real. And, and he gives you access to know him as a person Know him in his power. Know the principles and precepts of his practices. And know every promise that he has made to you. So I pray with everything in me. This was a risk. Can I just be honest? This was a risk. 
Uh, let me let you in on a little bit of what pastor's process has looked like over the last 12 months because I've known for a long time now that this was going to be the theme and this is the direction of my ministry my life I knew during the pandemic I called a small group of my brothers together and said listen we've got to win souls to Jesus Christ that has to become the priority I know that church is everything to everybody and they want what makes them entertained and feel good and makes them feel like they're a part of something that is popping something that is jumping something that is is thriving but I need them to understand that they can't be a part of the institution and not be a part of the Savior you can't be in the organization and miss the whole organism he is a living breathing he is a, a an exemplary individual that has the capacity to be learned of so that you will know more of your God let me tell you why the enemy has tricked us and put us in a posture in a place where we no longer know who Jesus is, where we know of him, where we want to. We don't mind him being in the vicinity, but we don't want him to be Lord in us. He can be on the block, but I don't need you in my house. I don't need you because if you're in my heart, that means I have to make you my Lord. And if I make you my Lord and Savior. You don't mind him being your savior because when you're in trouble, you want somebody to rescue you. Isn't it amazing that everybody becomes holy when somebody dies? Ain't it amazing that everybody finds God when they get locked up? It's never hard for you to find a savior, but it's hard for you to accept the Lord. Nobody gonna tell me what to do. We ain't slaves no more. No, no, no. You have to become a slave of this ministry. I'm not talking about me and I'm not talking about victory. I'm talking about Jesus Christ because he has to be your master. He has to be your rabbi. He has to be your teacher. He has to be, come on now, he has to be your authority. He has to be your chief philosopher. He has to be your chief shepherd. He has to be your chief apostle. You've got to make him Lord. That means if Jesus can't tell you what to do, quit saying you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If he can't correct you, if he can't check you, if he can't send a no and you not throw a tantrum like a little kid and say, I'm going to take my ball and go home, I'm leaving this church. What it means is that you're a member of a body, you're a member of an organization, but you're not a member of the organism. It means that you're a member of a church or a fellowship, but you're not a member of, of the body of Jesus Christ. Because I don't have the authority to be his Lord. I don't have the authority. Let me tell you, there's a whole lot of things I would not have done if I could have said no. But I have to be obedient. I have to literally subject myself. His ma he has to become my master. I have to make him my Lord, which means that even when I don't feel like it, I got to believe that he's got my best interest. He says, and we know that all things, and we know, know, know that all things work together for the good. Together. That means the bad works with the good. The uncomfortable works with the comfortable. The things that are unpleasing work with the pleasing. I have to trust that he's never going to steal me wrong and that whatever I'm getting out of this situation and this season is for my good. That's what it means to know Jesus. To know him is to love him. Let me explain again why, I, I never finished this, but why, why the enemy has tricked us into not wanting to make sure that Jesus is the priority of our lives. That make sure that we're not submitting to him as Lord. To make sure that we're just comfortable and convenient Christians where we look one way on Sunday, but we act like something else from Monday through Saturday. It's a trick of the devil. Slap your neighbor until they weave, shake a little and say, tricks are for kids. Grow up. Here it is. Because the people that know their God shall do great exploits. Your power comes from your proximity. The further you are away from God, the less power you really have access to. That means the less authority you're going to have, the less favor you're going to walk in, the less doors you're going to be able to go through, the less opportunities you're going to be able to captivate and even discern and realize are right in front of you. The more you are, the closer you are to God, the more you have access to the authority and the things of God. Are you with me? 
So I need you to be clear. It's not your job. It's not your, it's not where you came from. It's not your degrees. It's not your pedigree. It's not who you know. It's not your bank account. It's not all of the things that the world says make you somebody. It's not the things that the, that the world is writing about you. People are saying about you. No, it's all about what is Christ saying about you. But more importantly, where is Christ inside of you? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Here's the problem. Let me set the thesis of this thing. The problem is all have sin. Sin is our problem. Let me go ahead and do this power people poll right now. If there's anybody who has never sinned in your entire life, raise your hand and come to the altar because we need to deliver you right now from the spirit of ignorance and lies. Anybody? All right. Nobody. All right. Okay, let me do the other way. How many of you have sinned? Okay, just in case you didn't know, when you thought it, you sinned it. <laughs> oh, brother just said, ooh. The moment you thought it, you sinned it. You sinned in that moment by thought, word, deed, by omission and commission, the things I did and even the things that I was supposed to and that I did not do. So we are all sinners. Here's what frustrates me about Jesus' people. The fake side. The distant cousins in them. That we all have sinned so it gives none of us authority or the right to look down on somebody else because they are sinners, because they sinned, or because they are in the middle of sinning. The Bible says, pray for them. With loving kindness have I won them. The Spirit of God, the truth of God, the Word of God. See, when, what happens is we start using our own words as weapons. And what we don't understand is our word doesn't have any authority unless it's backed by His Word. You can't use what you don't know. You can't use what you don't have. So you have to have His Word. All have sinned. How many have sinned? All. Say it one more time. So you cannot start, let, let, let's, get this, uh, let's get this straight up front. Make sure that you do not put yourself in a posture of condemnation and or uh, dictating the terms of somebody's eternity based upon their inability to exhibit godliness or righteousness in the now. Because God has a way of flipping the script. He says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He has a way of turning the thing around. And the same people that persecuted the church will be the same people that end up being one of the greatest preachers of the church. Come here, Saul, and testify. Come on and tell them. You were the one that were killing Christians and he turned that thing around. The, the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the master and he turns it whichever way he chooses. So how many have sinned? Okay, here's the problem. If all of us have sinned, then all of us have experienced separation. If all of us didn't, we weren't born saved, and just in case you didn't know, you were not born saved. That means you had a season and a whole spirit of, uh, where the whole spirit of separation was a, uh, uh, putting a, an abyss between you and between God. Because sin separates. That's literally what it means to separate. It means to isolate, and it pulls you away from God. This is why this is an urgent message for us this year. Because if people died, if we're born, we're born of the flesh until we're born of the spirit. Born of the flesh wasn't your choice. You didn't get to decide, I think I want to be born here to this particular set of parents. You didn't get to make a decision. But to be born of the spirit, you get to make a decision. I want to be born of God, which is your choice. Are you with me? So when you're born of the flesh, there is a period between born of the flesh and born of the spirit. If something, because you're born of flesh and the flesh kills, if you're born of flesh and you're separated from God, you're separated from God, meaning that if something happens, between the period of born of the flesh and then born of the spirit and you leave this world and don't have an opportunity to be born of the spirit, you will spend eternity separated from God. Some people call it hell. 
That's what we call it here. Just in case one had, I don't want no questions about our theology. We believe in heaven and we also believe in hell. The Bible says that there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There'll be torment forever. And so this is how simple and powerful this message is. You have a choice. It's not by luck, chance, or happenstance that you made it today. You're seated in the sanctuary of the saints right now because he ordered your steps. No, it wasn't because somebody invited you. It wasn't because you just got up and you felt like it. No, the Holy Spirit tapped you on the shoulder and said, get up, put your clothes on, scoot, roll, crawl, get to the house of God. Watch this worship experience. Stop, pause, put your browser right here because this is where you need to hear this message today. I, it, the urgency is there are so many of our friends, our family members, our co-workers, our colleagues, and the strangers that we encounter on the street who are still in their flesh and have not yet received the spirit of God the grace of God through the power of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ and we run the risk of them dying in this space because we don't know the day nor the hour there was an appointed time for man to be born and to die if they don't receive Christ in here then they're going to spend eternity I don't care how how much you get up lying over their body when they gone? If they die in sin, they are separated from God. That is the urgency of this message. See now, and this is my, I told you I was going to be transparent and share my struggle. My struggle is that, that, that these are not messages that make you feel warm and fuzzy. When I'm teaching truth like this, this is not going to cause you to be sitting there and be like, oh my God, it was good. Pastor preach. I, oh, ain't, I ain't even going to holler today. So if you came for me to shout you, fire, I ain't happening today. This ain't the day. No, no, because truth needs no help. It stands all by itself. How many of us have sinned? See, this is the hope of Jesus Christ. All have sinned and we have created varying degrees of sin for our own comfort. We look at that sin as worse than our sin and this sin is... Our, no, we, that's for our own comfort. You did that for yourself. Because you, you're talking about somebody else for what you, you, you did something different. You're going to be mad at them because they sin different than you. Help me out. Turn to somebody and say, yes, you too. You too. You know, you too. Girl, did you hear about what Bishop did? Did you hear about what Pastor did? Did you hear about what? No, no. Look at them and, and look at somebody else in the eye. No, look at all, all three of their teeth. And say, you too. <laughs> Romans 3 and 23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So either it's righteousness or unrighteousness. That's it. All sinners by definition are unrighteous and imperfect. All things that are, less than, that are less than holy share the same quality of unholiness. Except, here's the hope, through Jesus Christ. Except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is new beginnings. He is new life. He is a new chance. He is hope. That's why it's got to be urgent to you. That's why you got to be sitting around and instead of y'all arguing over the domino table, you got to be saying, is everybody here saved first? <laughs> no, no. Have you received Christ as your savior? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Romans 10 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord was raised from the dead. In other words, I'm making him Lord and I believe by faith that God was able to raise him from the dead. That means he is my Savior and I accept him as Lord of my life. That means he is my head and I shall be saved. It ain't hard, it ain't heavy, it ain't deep. It's simple. He wanted everybody to have access for the Jew and the Gentile. That means for all of those who will receive, whosoever will give themselves to Jesus Christ and believe in him. God says them, those will be the saved. Those will be the ones who are rescued. Those will be the ones when they die, they will not have to be separated from an awesome God and spend eternity in heaven with him. That's the message of the cross. That is the message of the church. That is the message of a congregation that is sold out for one cause only. And that is Jesus, period. Except through Jesus. He's a, he's a God of new beginnings and he sent Jesus to make it happen. 
That's why Jesus is so important to the, to the saints. Because without him, we're separate from God. And without him, there's no new life. Without him, there's no new chance. Without him, there's no new beginning. Without him, there is no connection to God. We need him. Are you with me? We need him. John 1 is a conscious connection to Genesis. I want you to, this is why I started here. Because I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to see that Jesus has been there the entire time. He didn't just come on the scene. Most of us think that Jesus began in Bethlehem. And that he ended at the cross. No, no. His beginning wasn't in the manger. His beginning wasn't in Bethlehem. His beginning wasn't in Jerusalem. And his ending wasn't on Calvary. There's a season in between. Adv so Advent is the season of Jesus' birth. That's when we celebrate the birth of Jesus in the Christian calendar. Then there's Lent, which is the death of Jesus. Advent is the birth. Lent is is the death. But there is a season that happens in between in the Christian calendar that's called Epiphany, which is the season in the Christian calendar when we celebrate or we talk about the life of Jesus Christ. Most of us spend our time completely in the Advent or celebrating Lent, but none of us really experience Epiphany, which an Epiphany means there's light. In the Greek, it, it translates manifestation or appearance. We don't know when he appeared. We don't know where he appeared or how it was manifested that Jesus was here. But we got to go to the beginning and understand that it did not start in the manger, but it started at the beginning. Are you with me? Genesis 1. In the beginning. Genesis 1 declares in the beginning, in the beginning. In the beginning, in the beginning there was light. In the beginning there was light. And if you get all the way over here to John 1, John 1 is a conscious connection to Genesis in the beginning. When he said in the beginning let there be light, he was essentially saying in the beginning let there be Jesus. Because Jesus is the light of this world and more importantly in him there is light and so when we're in him his light is in us that's why he calls you a city on a hill whose light cannot be hidden you then become as a result of him the light in this world are you with me he is the light of the world but you are to be a light in the world let your light so shine before people that they can see your good works but give glory to the one who invested light in you he was in the beginning okay let me help you out it all starts with him everybody has a new year's resolai but it all starts with him the problem is why you can't keep it and it doesn't become a resolution is because you're being resolute on something and don't realize it doesn't work without the person who came in the beginning. New starts are with him. Epiphany means there is light in the beginning. So the first chapter of this particular book of John is called a prologue. It is the prelude. It is the intro. It is the whole music before the, the whole thing actually starts. And so the prologue is broken down. I'm going to break it down into three different sections for you. In verses 1 through, and that's 1 through 14 total. But in verses 1 through 4, there's a claim made. Somebody say claim. Ain't nobody writing. I hope y'all getting this. I promise I'm going to break this down and put meat in your lap today. There's a claim being made. Verses 1 through 4, there's a claim being made. In verses 5 through 11, there's a rejection of the claim. And in verses 12 through 14, there's a response to the rejection of the claim. There's a response. There's a claim in verses four, 1 through 4. In verses 5 through 11, there's a rejection of the claim. In verses 12 through 14, there's a response to the rejection of the claim. So the first, a couple things that I want you to know that it talks about in, in, in this chapter. It gives you an indication of who Jesus is. It lets you know up front. In the beginning, if you're going to learn about Christ, 
you have to go back to the beginning. Some of you, how many of you start like to start movies in the middle? We're praying for you. I hate when people come in the room, they want to start a movie in the middle and they want to ask me everything that happened in the beginning. So now what is he talking about? Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. You need to go back and watch the beginning because if you don't have the beginning, you won't understand what's in the middle and you will never make it to the ending. Are you with me? So if you're going to understand Jesus, you got to go back to the beginning. So here's what happens in the beginning. First of all, in the beginning, it makes sure that you understand that he is the word. This scriptural passage says that the word is a person. Most of us think that the word is this, this book that our parents carried called the Bible. Most of us think that the book that in, in our digital format that is known as the Bible, that that alone is the word. But the word is a person. Jesus is the word. In verse 3, it says, all things were made by who? Him. Him. He. Those are his pronouns. Him. I'm going to drop it. I ain't going to push it. The word is a person. He. All things were made by him. I, I know I'm almost done with this sermon. It's that, it's, it's that simple. <laughs> Then the second thing that the Bible says in this particular passage is that the word is a divine person, not divine-ish. In other words, the word was God. Which means that the word, the person of the word, which is who, what's his name? Was God. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Before, before it all, he was God. The word is a divine person, meaning that the word has divine authority. That is outside, that is supernatural authority. That is above natural authority. He is the word of God. The third thing that it says about your Jesus, our Jesus, is that he is an uncreated divine person. Are you with me? Okay, let me back up. No child left behind. Come closer. Lean in. The word is a person. The word is a divine person because the word was God. And then thirdly, he's an uncreated divine person. Through him, all things were created that were created. In other words, everything that has a beginning got a beginning through him. Everything that you see that was created was created by him, which means he doesn't have a beginning. Who can testify of his beginning if they were not here? Nobody can tell you where he began. And most of us will think of this as simply God. But I want to make sure you understand that it wasn't just God. God alone but it was God in three persons and I, I'm specifically hanging my hat on this because I want to teach us about who our Savior really is so in order to understand who he really is you got to go back to the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in other words the word is a person the word is a divine person he is God and he is an uncreated divine person meaning that he stepped outside of everything and created all things not only that I want you to understand that he's the source of all life in him there is life life begins in him that's why it's so important for you to be in Christ Jesus because you, if, if, you, if you're not in Christ Jesus, you're living but you've never lived. There is no life apart from him. You are a dead man or dead woman walking. 
Because in him there is life outside and apart from him, from him there is death. But what does it mean there's death? Because I'm, I'm still moving and operating. I'm still, no, you are, you, are, you are physically alive, but you are spiritually dead. So the most important thing for your life is to be in him so that your spirit man can live. I don't want you spiritually dead and simply walking around in physical life. Here's why. Because there's no joy there. You are trying to find happiness. That's why you're doing all that you're doing with who you're doing it with. Because you're trying to find happiness. You are, that's why you keep hanging out where you're hanging out. And that's why you never can get enough of what you can't get enough of. It's because you're trying to get a physical fix. You're trying to please your flesh. You're trying to appease your happiness meter. But when you have joy, the things that made you happy don't even bother you or won't even, you won't even have a taste for them anymore. When I have joy, I can't let you mess up what God is doing on the inside by putting some foolishness on my outside. When you have joy, you ain't got to go to the club. I ain't got to hang out with you. As a matter of fact, I really don't care whether you decide to be my friend. Can we be honest about it? When we have joy, it's not about outside. It's about what's on the That's what I'm trying to help you get. If you will jump in Christ Jesus, his spirit will jump inside of you. And his spirit, greater is he that is in me than anything I got to contend with in the world. Are y'all with me so far? Okay. He's the source of all life. This is the last thing. And his name is. I'm going to back up and do a review for you. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He is, he is the word. The word is a person. He. All things were made by him. The word is a divine person. The word of God. He, the, he, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. He is an uncreated person. All things were made by him. He's the source of all life. In him, there is life. And his name is? In the 14th chapter, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among him. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. So in other words, the creator has become a part of his creation. All present. All knowing unchanging unfathomable eternal God in three persons and he chose to dwell among us why would he do that why would he leave eternity and subject himself to time why would he position himself if he's an omnipresent omniscient God if, why would in the, and he's the God of the beginning why would he even put himself in a position where he would actually have to come down and become flesh why would, the, why would the creator become a part of his own creation? One reason. So that he may save mankind. That's it. So the central claim being made in the text is that in, in the book of John, the first part of John, is that he is the word. Jesus is the word. Right there, if you translate it in the Greek from the original language where John was actually writing it, it means logos. He is the logos. So in other words, it could say in the beginning was the logos and the logos was with God and the logos was God. Logos. It's important for you to know that because logos is the reason. It means rather the reason or purpose for something's existence. It doesn't just mean word. It means the reason something exists. So in the beginning was the reason someone or something exists. The logos. Another word that we get out of that word is logic. It makes it. You know, you heard people say, make it make sense. God says, let me make it make sense for you. I am the logos or the reason something exists. It tells you what something was made for. 
it gives you clarity on the purpose of a thing. In other words, it gives you directions. All right. So has anybody ever gotten anything and it came with a book of directions? Well, let me try it again. Has anybody ever received something with a book of directions, whether you read it or not? Okay. So the directions give you an indication of the purpose and or how you are to use a specific thing. When you read the directions, it tells you how something is purposed to be used and how it works. When you don't use the directions, you run the risk of destroying the thing that you got to use and or burning something or breaking something forever, breaking something that will not be used again because it was misused or abused. You with me so far? So the directions urge you to align your use of the item with its original design. It was made to do something and it was made not to be used for something else. That's why you see X's and symbols and they have to put big old red X's or hazard or caution because if you use it the wrong way, you'll destroy it or you'll destroy everything around it. In other words, you'll never get the value out of what you just bought, what you acquired. You'll burn everything up or tear everything down. What if life has a logos? What, what if there's a reason for life? And that if we don't align ourselves with that purpose for our lives, we run the risk of tearing everything up or burning everything down. Our lives will not go well until we align with the logos or the reason for our existence. Who is the reason for our existence? Who is the one that gives our life purpose? Okay, let me help you out. You can never know the purpose of a thing without searching the mind of the creator of the thing. If you don't search the mind of the creator of the thing, you'll never know what the thing is for. And so God says, I need you to know what's in my mind, because if you don't know what's in my mind and you don't understand what I created this for, what I created you for, you're going to misuse and abuse your entire life and everything that I tried to get you to be, you'll never get the opportunity to become. So the claim was made. The claim is Jesus. The claim is that the word came and it was made, he was made flesh. The claim is that God is a, uh, in the beginning was with God, was with, what was God. Uh, the claim is that Jesus was there in the beginning. The claim is that Jesus is the arbiter. He's the perpetuator rather of new beginnings. That he is the beginning. He, as a matter of fact, he says, I am the alpha. I am the beginning. So that is the claim that's being made. But then watch, don't miss this. Then there's the rejection of the claim. Go to verse 10 again. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. 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 He's in the world. He who created the world stepped into this creation and the world knew him not. If You don't see the signs that the people around in the world do not know who Jesus is. The blatant disregard and disrespect for who Jesus is. The obvious rejection and dejection of who Jesus is. They, they will say things now that they never would say historical times past. They will do things. I remember when the wine would put his wine down when he was walking past the church. I remember when my uncles used to have a cigarette hanging on the lip. But as soon as they walked past the house of God, they put it down like, they, like he couldn't see it. I remember when people wouldn't curse on the church grounds. Come on, somebody. Heaven forbid you disrupt and dis uh, in, in the Lord's house. I remember you couldn't even touch the communion table. Don't you lean on that altar. Get off that altar. Y'all remember when, 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 when you couldn't even walk past, you couldn't even walk in the pulpit. Them old ladies with them stockings on their knee twisted and then not in the side, them white shoes on will come out of nowhere. Get over here, boy. 
This is the house of God. There is such a rejection of the things of God and more specifically of Jesus. And so when you stand for Jesus, come on here somebody. When you represent him, you'll lose followers. You'll be persecuted for his namesake. And he calls you blessed for doing it. Yeah, we think that being blessed and favored means that I fit in. That I look like everybody else looks. That I'm cool. That everybody wants to be like me and I want to be like them. So we are one. We're the same. No, I'm just trying to embrace. No, that is not the message of Jesus Christ. He said, I I'm blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. He makes it very clear that when you are walking with him, riding with him, when he is the, at the forefront, there will be rejection. Scripture says that the world loves its own. There will be rejection. I have to prep you for that because if I don't, I, I, I cause you to become a cynical Christian. If you believe that everything is going to be all better roses... And then something happens or there's rejection or the world rejects the fact that you're trying to walk according to the things and the ways and the practices of Christ. Then you'll say, well, I don't want to do this Christian stuff. It ain't about nothing, no way. Or when you see somebody who has fallen or you see somebody who has sinned, you want to walk away and throw the whole baby out. It's because you have not been prepped and prepared to understand that there will be rejection. There's a rejection of the claim. Jesus is God. God was in the beginning. God created all things. This is the claim. Then they reject the claim. But watch this. The world knew him not. Then he came to his own church members. Then he came to his own victory walkers. Then he came to his own people who love their God. Then he came to the shouters and the dancers. Then he came to the habitual flawless outers. <laughs> and they received him not. I'm good as long as you're in the vicinity, but I don't need you to be my Lord. I'm okay until you tell me I got to take out of my hand what I want to put in my hand. I'm all right unless you tell me I got to leave him and walk according to your will and the righteous lifestyle. I'm all right if you say I should shun the very appearance of evil and I can't put myself in, in compromising positions and situations. I'm okay until you tell me that I got to let that go. I'm all right until you tell me I can't have fun. <laughs> Preach, boy. until it costs me something you my lord until it get to a place where I'm uncomfortable because heaven forbid I'm uncomfortable you don't know uh, me myself and I you don't know who I am what I struggled and I went through you don't know the sacrifices I made you ain't gonna take this from me I can do this you can do this and be I'm saved and, I, and I'm a gangster What they call it, righteous and righteous. I'm gonna let you feel that for a minute. That's called conviction. When you can't say amen, say ouch. And he came to his own. He came to those who said, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. And they received him not. Churches, come on. We got to get it together. Believers, we got to get it together. Faith walkers, we got to get it together. How can we win people to a Christ we don't know? And how can we win, to, win them to a place we won't even go? And how can we get them to enjoy a place we won't even stay? Let me tell you about your purpose. Your purpose is to make disciples of other people. 
He says, go make disciples of other people. Go win them. Go wear a shirt in the mall. Go, go, go and witness to somebody and just talk about how good God has been to you. When they're complaining in the break room, say, you know what? I'm so grateful to have this job. I have had seasons in my life when I couldn't find one and I didn't know my money was funny, my finances were fickle, and my pennies were few, but God made a way out of no way. Unashamedly, we are not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ, but, but we, 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 we have to tell somebody about him and it's hard to tell somebody about somebody you don't know that's why every month of this year all I'm talking about is Jesus. that was the temptation that was the temptation because the temptation is I gotta have a sensational title I gotta have something sexy for the saints well, God's gonna do more in 24 Oh, everybody going to shout. We turning over tables and chairs. Yes, Jesus. More. More for my life. He said, I'm tired of doing more for you and you don't even appreciate what I did. And you've lost your sense of wonder and awe for what I've done because you've gotten too comfortable and think you did it. So I got to remind you, I was the one in the beginning. When your mama, when your dad, I knew you before they formed you in her womb. I am the beginning. I'm the author. I am the finisher. He says, I need you to know me. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I need you to know me. So then he gives, in the last part, and I'm done. He gives a response to the claim. Here's the response. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. He says, as many as would receive him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. Okay, this is why you didn't shout right there. Barack Obama was in the White House for eight years. And we had the privilege of seeing his babies, who were little babies when he stood on stage downtown Chicago and he took the office of president. And it was a, it was a wonder. This is not about politics. This is not about Barack. This is about the babies. Those little girls now are grown women. They're, they're some beautiful, tall women. But those of us who watched the whole journey, we saw them like little kids. And they had both the burden and the blessing. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is, but there is a burden. They had the burden and the blessing of growing up in the public eye and the public scrutiny. They had the burden and the blessing of growing up in the White House. So it comes with, uh, everybody wants to run the favor, but you don't understand favor is heavy. I hope you don't get mad at me for telling this, but I, I kept trying to tell Todd that when he was younger, he was running, he wanted it. I want the favor of God. I want the favor. I kept saying, not yet. Not yet. Well, he talked about me, wanted to fight me. <laughs> Called me, going off on me, set me straight. I said, hey, at the end of the day, when you get done, I love you too much to give you what you're asking me for. Because I understand that favor is these little girls grew up in the White House, to, and, and as a matter of fact, Todd will testify to himself, because now he has the favor. It's, it's, it's a major favor on his life. And I have to actually get up under his arm sometimes and encourage him and tell him, you got this. Keep going. You got it. You got this. Because I recognize that favor is heavy. These little girls now, they understand that same thing. Favor is heavy. If you, as a citizen of the United States of America, and the children of the president of the United States. If they're out somewhere and they're playing, they have a detail around them. And the detail around them is there for their protection. They grow up with the burden, 
He also experienced the blessings. He had a lot of favor, a lot of access, a lot of resources to, to tap into. But the burden of it was that they could not do everything. They could not go everywhere. And they always had to be protected. So they kind of lived in this isolated bubble. If you as a citizen of the United States, you see them in the park and their secret service posted up, people are watching them, but their kids, they're trying to give them some level of normalcy. And you coming across there, you say, oh my God, it's Sasha and Malia. <laughs> Let's just say you walk over here and you're gonna go talk to them. <laughs> secret service gonna say, excuse me. No, no, no. No, no, you can't. No, no, I'm a citizen of the United States. No, no, no. You cannot go over there and talk to him. I'm sorry. You can't. And then what, what, what would happen if the children over there playing, they're guarding them, and you just break out running towards them? <laughs> You're going to die. So rap, they're going to shoot you. You just break off running towards the... Why, why, would they, why would they do that? Why would they defend them like that? Why would they shoot them like that? Why would they... Because they're just little girls. They're just children. No, no, no. They're not just children. They're the president's kids. That's different. When the enemy... sees you and you are a son or a daughter of God and he decides he's going to break off and take over your life you got angels that will be dispatched all around your life when the enemy comes in like a flood God raises a standard against him and the standard's name is That's why we're excited that he made us the sons of God, the daughters of God, the people of God. And the word, last in 6, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacle. So, and the word tabernacled among us. And the word tabernacle means it's a dwelling place of God. It's where the Spirit of God is manifested. It's where ministry goes forth. It's where things of God are taught and revealed. So God in Jesus came and tabernacled among us so that we could experience his glory. We could experience the magnificence of God. We could be in fellowship and communion with God. And he did not have to do it, but he did. Here's the prerequisite to the promise. Here's it. This is it. This is the prerequisite. You got to believe. You got to believe. You got to believe. When Mary was standing there at the grave, or standing there and her brother had died, she says, Huh? I know he'll live again in the resurrection. Jesus says, No, 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 no. <laughs> I am. It, essentially, what he's saying is, No, I'm the new beginning. I, I'm, I'm in the beginning was me. I'm, I'm the, I created all things. Do you not think I can handle your thing and your thing and your thing and this little thing and what you think is a great thing? And the, I created all things. You don't think I can handle these things? What would make you think that I, I could create the universe, hang the stars and the moon in their sockets and eons later, the same word that I put them where they're hanging in the same place. What would make you think I can't cause the sun and the moon to play tag your it and come out at the appropriate time, draw a land in the sand, a line in the sand and say the sea can come this far, but it cannot come further. What would make you think that the God who scooped out everything, threw up mountains and caused them to peek through the clouds in the sky what would make you think that 
I could not handle this. What would make you think that your problem, your pain, your mistakes, your shortcomings, your failures, your faults, your hangups, that I can't handle your situation? I am God. I am the Alpha. I am the beginning. Everything will become new when you put yourself in me. Every person becomes a new creature when you put yourself in me. You didn't have to wait till January the 1st to celebrate New Year. A new year begins in Jesus. And he came in the flesh so that you could become a son or a daughter of God.